Mungu ibariki Afrika ili ipate kuendelea maombi yetu ya sikilizwe uje utubariki uje utubariki uje roho Ujero, 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 utubariki, uje, utubariki, mkosi sikeleli Afrika. Malu pakan isu pondulu ayo Isu ay mitanda zoe etu Nkosi sikelela Tina lusapolu ayo Wouza moya Wouza moya Wouza moya Wouza moya Wouza moya, oh yingwele, usisi kelele, tina, lusapulwa yo. So once again, on behalf of Howard University, we welcome you all to the Mecca. And at this moment, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Ambassador Mula Mula, Mr. Melvin Foote, and all other protocols of said for all the other dignitaries within uh, in our presence. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge my fellow faculty and our great students. Everyone, welcome to Howard University. And I would proceed by inviting Dr. Mohamed Kamara, who is the chair of the Department of African Studies, to give us a welcome remarks. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Dauni, and thank you, Dr. Clark, the two co-organizers of this uh, uh, important event. Uh, here at Howard University, we have always have uh, rising stars from the faculty, from the staff, and from students. And uh, I am very pleased to brag about uh, Dr. Downey and Dr. Clark's uh, accomplishments and standing as uh, uh, some of those rising stars. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to welcome you to this event, which is devoted to a dialogue on Africa and Pan-Africanism at a time when, despite all the challenges facing her, Africa is becoming increasingly a powerful player in international relations, in international affairs, and in global affairs, whether it is in the academia, whether it's in business, in the search for international peace and security in a very challenging world, to put it mildly, Africa is not just the geopolitical center of the world as we see on the globe, it is a strategic, epicenter of world affairs. And it is in that spirit that we are holding this event. It is certainly a privilege to have with us for this dialogue, Professor PLO Lumumba, an award-winning African scholar and a distinguished specialist of Pan-Africanism. Professor Lumumba, Howard University and the DC community are pleased to have you 
and to welcome you here at the Mecca, which is a place that is unique, inspiring, and forward-looking with its standing and long-standing legacy of positive and constructive engagement with the continent of Africa and also with global Africa. Howard gives you, Professor Lumumba, a big blue bison welcome with the conviction that this will be the beginning of a lasting partnership with you and with scholars, researchers, and advocates like you in Africa and in the African diaspora. And I would like to close by again welcoming all of you, the dignitaries, the faculty, the staff, the students of Howard University. And please, always consider Howard as your home, far away from home or near to home. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I will have to beg your indulgence because I'm already late for a meeting. So please uh, forgive me. Thank you. Dr. Kamara, thank you very much for the opening remarks. At this moment, I would like to invite Ms. Ayana Gregory to give us an opening song to welcome the ancestors and to welcome our speaker. Ms. Ayana. It is an honor to be in your presence, Professor Lumumba. It is an honor to be here. I stand before you, one of ten children born to Lillian and Dick Gregory. My father was a revolutionary. I was raised in a revolutionary home. I have lent my voice for the unification and liberation of our people. I stand before you understanding that we are the ones that we have been waiting for. I stand before you in the best of times and the worst of times, and we say that we are right on time. Hey, 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 hey. No more leaving small, no more giving just a little, no more being shy, no more staying in the middle. We about to take flight, so you better hold on. Flying through the night, put your night vision on. With the eye of the eagle, the heart of a lion, the wings of an angel to keep me flying. Light as a feather, cause a smile every day. The love in my heart, I give it away. Places we will go, things that we will see. Heaven only knows all oh, that we will be. The magic that you have, if you only knew, hey, who you really are. The things that you could do. Hey, some people, when you're gonna shine like the light you are. Hey, some people, they can't hold you back cause you come too far. Some people, the planets in the galaxy are calling you. Hey, stop people. It's time for you to do what you came to do. Na 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 na. Mother, Father, God, ancestors, spirit guides, and guardian angels. We give thanks for you coming to us and through us. We are the ones that we have been waiting for. African people are the parents of humanity. And it is up to us to restore this planet to its original state of balance and order. We are qualified. We are qualified. Ooh. So as we understand that, that music and vibration has power, 
I would like for us in this collective moment, this unified moment, I would like for us to create a collective moment of word sound power. Are y'all with me? So I want you to do this with me. And we understand that everything that comes out of here doesn't just affect this room, it affects this whole planet. Are y'all ready? Here we go. Ooh. So you better hold on Flying through the night Put your night vision on With the eye of the evil The heart of a lion The wings of an angel To keep me flying Like there's a feather Cause I smile every day The love in my heart I give it away Places we will go Things that we will see hey, Heaven only knows All that we will be that you have if you only knew who you really are the things that you could do everybody say hey some people hey some people hey some people hey I give thanks. Give thanks and praise to the Most High. Always remember, from once we've come, it is our time to unify. It is our time to understand that we don't need the physical might to do it. We are the spiritual magic makers. We are the shapeshifters. We are the ones that can change this planet in one day, just because we say that we will, just because we intend it to be so. It is our time. It is our time. Ashe. Ashe. And I would like to first begin by acknowledging the princess, the queen, the queen mother, the one behind the man, <laughs> Mrs. Lumumba. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so it's my honor, privilege, and my dream to introduce a man who needs no introduction. If I were to introduce him to read his full biography, we will stay till 10. <laughs> Just a brief version of it. So without giving you all the details, for those who don't know him, I would encourage you to open your heart, to open your ears, to open your eyes, and watch magic happen. <laughs> Professor P.L.O. Lumumba is a distinguished lawyer. Better still, in Kenya, they would call him a barrister at law. He is a son of Kenya, but he's a great son of Africa. He's a greater son of the diaspora. 
He's a Pan-African crusader. I am happy to say Karibu Howard University. Karibu Washington, D.C. I'm happy to say welcome to say Akwaba. Professor Lumumba, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me uh, do what the Nigerians now do, to say that I stand on the protocol as already established. <laughs> I think that saves me from making mistakes as to who is to be mentioned first. As we were driving here, I remembered a speech that was delivered by Martin Luther King Jr. several years ago, and he arrived late, and not for reasons occasioned by him, but by dint of logistics. And he said that it was better that he arrived late than it to be said the late Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> I too am happy that we are late, but it's not the late PLO Lumumba. <laughs> so there is a sense in which I'm happy to be here and to share my thoughts with you on a subject that I think is critical and important, particularly at this stage in the history of Africa. When one is confronted with a subject as contemporary as the relationship between Africa and the diaspora, one can begin one's intervention in many ways. One can choose to look at the history and talk about the history of slavery because there is a sense in which slavery birthed the diaspora. But a lot already has been said and written about it, and therefore it adds no value in a setting such as this to repeat the history that is well known to you. One can go a little further and talk about colonization, and talk about how Africa was partitioned by the European powers in 1884 in a manner most arbitrary. And one need not spend too much time on that because that history is already very well known. One can also choose to talk about the process of decolonization and talk about the contribution of the many Africans that contributed to the liberation of Africa, notwithstanding that that process continued very late and in the minds of some is still work in progress. But even that may not be very important because the history of decolonization is well documented and is known to us one can come a little closer and argue that the process of decolonization was not complete and that therefore what we ought to grapple with is the neo-colonial project and how pernicious it has been and how it has served to undermine Africa in her politics, in her economics and in her social cohesion and how it continues to do so. And one can say that even that is very well documented and need not be the subject of our focus. One can then say that perhaps we ought to look at Africa as she is today and look at how our sons and daughters are distributed in different parts of the world. And that is the context in which one should situate one's debate. And perhaps there is sense in situating the debate in that arena. 
And if that, that becomes the locus of my engagement and intervention, permit me to start with a famous speech delivered in Portuguese by a famous African son, Samora Moises Marshall. Samora Moises Marshall it delivered this speech and said what I'm about to say many times. The very first time that he said this was in the heat of the struggle for independence of Mozambique. And he was talking about how the Africans relate to the colonial powers. And he reminded himself that there was a time when he attended a meeting and at that meeting the Africans who were colonized by the French were saying how proud they were that their colonizers were a civilization that was old and a civilization that was good and a civilization that was better and that therefore Although they were colonized, they were better than everybody else. And Samora marveled, but did not stop there. He said that those who were colonized by the British were also in the habit of how, saying how good they were, how the British had established an empire over which the sun did not set, and that they were therefore better. Those who were colonized by the Belgians would say the same thing. And those who were colonized by the Spaniards would say the same thing. And that therefore they looked down upon those who were colonized by the Portuguese, then one of the most backward nations in the continent of Europe. And he posed to his audience the question, how can that possibly be a source of pride how can it be that we think that our colonizers determine our status and circumstances? And he told them, there is no colonization which is humane. There is no colonization which is better than the other. There is no slave master who is better than the other. And I think those words of Samora Moises Marshall continue to ring through the vicissitudes of time, particularly at this time in the history of Africa, when Africa is asking, posing many questions about how she should conduct her affairs. Let us remind ourselves that the continent of Africa has always been an attractive continent throughout the ages. It was attractive to the slave masters when the world was agrarian and therefore the human resource that was needed in those days was African labor. And today, wherever you look, whether it is in Latin America or in North America or in Europe or in Australia, there is an African population, which we do not say often enough, but contributed to the progress and the development of those nations. When slavery lost her luster and it was no longer economically tenable, the African was treated differently and was the subject of colonization, which in many ways was latter-day slavery, latter-day used very creatively and carefully to define the colonial period. After the process of decolonization was over, the process of neocolonization took root, which begs the question, did it stop at any one time? And if it did stop, what is the status of Africa as we speak? Because even today we see yet another movement towards Africa. Not so long ago, not more than two months to be exact, I, like many, read and watched the news. And it was not lost on me that within a period of only several months, the African leaders had been invited to Beijing in China. And not immediately, not long, so long after that, the Chancellor of Germany was in Africa. 
And immediately after that, the French president was in Africa. And immediately after that, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom was in Africa. And immediately after that, the President of China was in Africa, so that Africa became some kind of political and economic mecca, giving meaning to these words that if the mountain cannot go to Muhammad, Muhammad will go to the mountain. Which begs the question, what is it in Africa that people seek? And how must Africa respond to the world in this environment? Many will say that the problems, if any, of Africa have been analyzed and perhaps overanalyzed. And we no longer need to paralyze ourselves through analysis. And it behooves us to make prescriptions on how we should grow Africa. There is merit in such arguments that we now pretty much know what Africa needs. And indeed, what Africa needs is, has always been known. And the most eloquent articulation of what Africa ought to do in order to realize our potential was articulated in 1963. I remind my audience, perhaps ad nauseum, that in 1963, regardless of who had colonized who, when the 32 African leaders met in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in the month of May 1963, it mattered not who was speaking, whether it was Ufe Bwanyi or Cote d'Ivoire or Kwame Nukuruma of Ghana or it was Amadou Ahijo who then made sense in, of the Cameroon or David Dako of Central African Republic or Hail Selassie of Ethiopia or Nyerere of Tanganyika then they were unanimous, unanimous and clear in their mind that for Africa to realize our potential, Africa had to unite. But they were not naive. They were not naive in assuming that unity meant unanimity. They were not naive in assuming that when they talked about unity, they did not appreciate the diversity of Africa. They were clear in their minds that our diversity was our strength and that that diversity need not be defined by others. They were alive to the fact that in our diversity we had been placed in pigeonholes and gridlocked by our erstwhile colonial powers and that therefore who, those who had been colonized by the Portuguese found themselves being described by politicians and historians and indeed anthropologists as lucifers in an attempt to pigeonhole them and to create a chasm between them and their African brethren. They were alive to the fact that through the, pr the process of assimilation, those who had been colonized by the French were being told that your ancestors were the girls and that they had been pigeonholed and a chasm was created between them and their brethren being told that you ought to gravitate towards Paris and that those who had been colonized by the British were also being reminded that they were Anglophones and that therefore in their clarity of mind and in their vision and I dare say perhaps in a manner that is hyperbolic that Kwame Nkrumah was or had the vision of a Jewish prophet, even without the gift. Why do I say so? He was able to recognize that if Africans did not deal with the fundamental issues in those very embryonic days, there was a danger that the erstwhile colonial power would use both subtle and indeed pernicious means to ensure that Africans were divided. How right they were. How right they were. 
that the dividends of independence did not come in the torrents that we had expected. Because what did we expect independence to give us? We expected that upon acquisition, if you may, or upon regaining our independence, our dignity would be restored. Because that indeed was the fountain from which our very being would be underlined and given her pride of place. The entire process of colonization was also a process of dehumanization. And the leaders of the day were clear that when we regain our independence, then we would be able to do things for ourselves, that we would be able to interact with other civilizations on an equal footing, that we would be able to create education systems that would be relevant to our people, that we would be able to grow our own food, that we would be able to exploit our resources in a manner that would be beneficial to us, that we would be able to do things that would be for the general good and the benefit of the peoples. And it is instructive that at that time when we were regaining our independence, the world was schizophrenic in many ways. And when I use the word schizophrenia, I'm using it as a term of art. It is always remembered that in 1900, important to remember that in 1945, when the entire continent of Africa was under the yoke of colonization, except for Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Ethiopia, the world was sitting in San Francisco and telling ourselves that all men are born equal. <laughs> it is instructive that three years later in Paris, France, in the year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is the same year that Hendrik Fafut was creating the apartheid government in South Africa and saying that Africans were fit to be drawers of water and he was a wood. So that schizophrenia of the world saying one thing with one side of the mouth and another with the other side, saying with its mouth what it did not believe in our head is what defines how we are today. So that Africa still finds herself punching below her political weight, punching below her economic weight, punching below her weight generally, great in prospect, but not in fact, which makes others think that Africa cannot be great. But I do not belong to that school, and we must never belong to that school, because the school that must carry the day is the school that tells us that Africa's better days are in front of her, and that Africa will be great. But it will not be great because of the number of speeches that we make or the pronouncements that we make or that we engage in prayer and fasting. Africa will be great if our sons and daughters are able to recognize what is in their best interest and they begin to engage in a constructive manner regardless of where they are. You know, when I look at some of the activities of the sons and daughters of Africa in the early 19th century. And I look at it in an environment where there were no aeroplanes. I look at it in an environment where there were no mobile phones. I look at it in an environment where the challenges of communication were obvious and indeed debilitating. Yet in the face of those difficulties, it was possible for Jamaica's Marcus Gavi to see that the salvation of the African people required, and if it did not require, demanded that they must work together. What vision in those early days? Yet, in those days, I can still hear the words of a man who is not mentioned as often as he should be. South Africa, speakly Kaisa Kaseme, speaking in 1906 here in the United States of America, and saying that Africa must be regenerated. 
I can still hear the many beautiful speeches of W.B. Dubois recognizing that the African Americans, even in those days, had to collaborate with their brethren in the mother continent. I can hear, even in those early days, the words of Martin Luther King Jr. And even the unguarded speeches of Malcolm X telling us that our success not only required but demanded that we work together. I can hear on that day of the independence of Ghana, Kwame Nukuruma says that the independence of Ghana means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. The question is, we who are their successors, are we truly their successors by what I did? Have we, as was expected of them, embraced the philosophy? If Kwame were to speak in 1957, would he have been right in saying, as Nigeria's Chinua Achebe once famously wrote in his book, Things Fall Apart, that we are the young suckers who would grow when the old bananas die? Mm -hmm. These are the questions that we must ask ourselves. And one can even see that it was not only in the political arena, because many times it is the tendency of many of us who have the opportunity to analyze these things, to think that activities that define our very being is to be found only in politics. When Harper Lee was writing To Kill a Mockingbird, could she have been speaking to us? When Jody Graft was writing his famous play Muntu, could he have been speaking to us? When Gabriel Okara was writing his book, The Voice, could he have been speaking to us? When Cyprian Equency was writing The Burning Grass, could he have been speaking to us? When Flora Nwapa was writing Efuru, could she have been speaking to us? When Peter Abrahams was writing his book The Mind Boy, could he have been speaking to us? When Alan Patton was writing Cry the Beloved Country, could he have been speaking to us? When Atolfo God was writing Blood Knot, could he have been speaking to us? And my view is that we have been spoken to in many ways, through different avenues. And it is not time for sorrows and lamentations, but time for us to ask ourselves what it is that we can do. The Africans in Jamaica, the Africans in Guyana, the Africans in Trinidad and Tobago, the Africans in Barbuda, the Africans in Suriname, the Africans in St. Kitts and Navy, the Africans in the continent of the United States of America, the Africans in Brazil, in Honduras, the Africans everywhere, is it not wise that we must now begin to redefine the manner in which we relate? Because how can it be? How can it be that a continent which is the richest continent on earth is the poorest continent on earth? How can it be that the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is perhaps the richest mineral resource country on earth, is the incubator of all unimaginable diseases? If it is not HIV debilitating, it is Ebola. How can it be? The truth is, as long as we remain disorganized, as long as the African-American still thinks that they are from mother continent, but they do not want to come in the mother continent, we are not going to use our energies as we should. You know, there is a little country from which Africans can learn. This little country 
had her sons and daughters dispersed throughout the world. Some were to be found in North Africa, some were to be found in Europe, some were to be found in Latin America, some were to be found in the United States. This little country had six million of her sons and daughters killed by Adolf Hitler. This little country is no bigger than the state of Maryland. This little country was created in 1948. This little country today is a heavyweight in technological affairs. This little country is Israel. That little country gives us education which we can learn from. If the 1.5 billion of us, regardless of wherever we are, were to make a decision and a deliberate decision that we can now begin to work together to reinvigorate the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. of W.E.B. Du Bois in the early 1960s and make Africa the Mecca to which we congregate for our political affairs, for our economic affairs, for to celebrate our diversity, you can begin to imagine what we can do. You can begin to imagine what we can do to ourselves. You know, sometimes when one travels, one is confronted with apparently innocuous things, but they are very telling. If you visit any typical airport in Europe, six out of ten times, the treatment that is meted against you, however subtle it is, is defined by the weakness of your mother continent. So that when you are talking about the most powerful passports on earth, there is not a single African country that is described as powerful. But yet I believe that if African countries could come together, and I'm not naive in suggesting, as I said a little earlier, that coming together means that we are unanimous about everything and that we are not diverse. That is not what I mean. What I mean is that our coming together must be based on our realization and recognition that we must emphasize more the things that unite us and de-emphasize the things that are likely to divide us. And that can be done, that has been done. The European Union has also demonstrated to us that you can run an organization that operates on the basis of 27 languages but identify things that allow us to realize our potential. And when I look at us, I think that we have those possibilities. And those possibilities have been identified. The African Union does not speak as eloquently and as loudly as it ought to be, and in my view does not speak as articulately as it ought to do in its, on its agenda 2063. I always remember that in the month of May, if it is, the year 2013, the year when Africa Agenda 2063 came into being, the then chair of the African Union, Kosan Adlamini Zuma, read what she said, and indeed it was a fictional letter to Kwame Nukuruma, saying in effect and telling Kwame, if indeed we, the African, lost the first 50 years after we regained our independence, we are just, not just about to lose another 50 years. We are going to ensure that by the year 2020, all the guns are silent in Africa. We are going to ensure that by the year 2025, all the pernicious foreign interference will not be allowed to have their pride of place in Africa. We are going to ensure that we have the equivalent of a Silicon Valley in Africa. We are going to ensure that we have an environment in Africa. We are going to ensure that we have education that addresses and informs our very well-being in Africa. 
We are going to ensure that we have medical facilities so that when our men and women are sick, they don't go to other civilizations. We are going to produce our own food. One can say that that is promising El Dorado, which will never come, but I think not. I hold the view that we have the intellectual wherewithal to achieve that. I hold the view that we have the ability to achieve that. And that to me is where the diaspora comes. You may not be Christian, some of you may be Muslim, but allow me to use this analogy to be found in the Christian Bible, the story of the sons of a Jewish patriarch, one of them called Joseph, who was sold into slavery and sojourned in Egypt. And there is a sense in which you Africans in the diaspora are like Joseph. You have come to a land and you have given ideas to this land and these lands in which you sojourn. When we come to you as Africans from the mother continent, we are coming to you because we believe that it is in the combination of our effort and the cross-fertilization of our ideas that we can indeed be in a position to make our mother continent great. But let you not be cheated but because sometimes in the process of analyzing the African problem, many times we speak as if nothing good is happening in Africa. False. There are many things that are happening in Africa which are good, but we never speak about them. Amen. We never speak about them because we never tell our story. Our story has always been told by others. And Chinua, Achebe, and Wole Shoinka were right. As long as the lions do not have their historians, it is always the exploits of the hunters that will be spoken about, not the bravery of the lions. But I'm submitting to us that time has come that we must begin to tell our story. Every civilization tells her story. The Arabs tell their stories through Al Jazeera. The British tell their stories through BBC. The Germans tell their stories through Deutsche Welle. The Americans will tell their story through CNN and Fox. The French tell their story through Radio France. The Africans must begin to tell their story from their perspective. And I believe that we have men and women in this continent and in other parts of the continent who are already beginning to do that. You not let you not be cheated. You know, it may be argued that we never went through the classical industrial revolution, but there is now a fourth industrial revolution. And I am certain that we will not be left out. The power of the medium that we now have will enable the Africans to tell their stories. But I was talking about good things that are happening in Africa. There are good things. If you go to the country of Ethiopia, there are good things that are happening there. You know, I remember so very vividly in the 1980 when a British musician held a concert. He was called Bob Geldof. And the only thing that he told the world is that the Ethiopians were dying because they were hungry. And we believe then that some musician could hold a concert and when that concert had been held, then the Ethiopians would be fed. The Ethiopians recognized that that is not the avenue. Today you go to Ethiopia and you see what they are doing in terms of installing electricity. You go to Addis Ababa, they will always have their problems. The Ethiopians are now saying that we are going to roast our own coffee. The Ethiopians are now saying that we are going to work our own leather. The Ethiopians are now saying that we are going to run our own airline and they are doing a good job of it. We can do it. And it is not only Ethiopia that is working. In 1966, when Botswana regained her independence, she was only famous for a number of things, that there were more cattle in Botswana than there were people. But we now know, after only a few years, Botswana is one of the few countries that enjoys a budget surplus, and they are beginning to add value to their diamond. Something is happening in Botswana. Something is happening in Angola, something is happening in Rwanda, something is happening in Kenya, something is happening in Tanzania, something is happening in Nigeria despite their problem, something is happening in Ghana. There may be a few flashpoints which we must deal with 
The things happening in Cameroon must be dealt with. Those happening in Central African Republic must be dealt with. Those happening in South Sudan must be dealt with. And I am saying that there is not a civilization that has been spared all those. Africa was organizing great kingdoms when the Europeans were still in caves. We can still do it. And I'm submitting to us that the only way in which we are going to do it is that we must work together. The things that we are talking about will not be achieved in the next one year. They may not be achieved in the next 10 years. They may not even be achieved in the next 100 years, but they may very well be achieved even in 10 years. For who knows when the door will give in? Who knows when the tipping point will arrive? And I'm saying that that is why the relationship between Africans and the diaspora, Africans in the diaspora is very critical. The beauty of men and women in the diaspora is that they have the go-getter spirit. He or she who leaves the continent of Africa to come to the United States of America has a hunting spirit. It is the spirit that propels him or her to go out because they know that in order to discover new islands, you must lose sight of the shores. And when they have lost sight of those shores, they come here and they receive all else. I listened to a great man saying one thing which I repeat to you. That the reason why the ocean never dries out is because the ocean never rejects any river. Any river that flows into her, the ocean receives. But the ocean also churns what she receives. Africa's greatness is that Africa has always accepted every civilization. But the time has come that we must redefine how we deal with this civilization. The new river that is flowing into Africa is a river called China. <laughs> that river is a river which 30 years ago could not flow. It was a pond. That river is a river that recognized that if you are to lift yourself up, you've got to lift yourself by your bootstraps. Some may say that we don't even have boots, so how can we lift ourselves by the bootstrap? But lift yourself nevertheless. They lifted themselves up and they are now looking at Africa. I do not blame them. I'm saying that there is something to learn from them. There is something to learn from them and the things to learn from China is the belief that you can do things for yourselves. And I'm saying that we Africans have demonstrated not once, not twice, but times without number that we have the physical and the intellectual wherewithal to do things for ourselves. We have done it in different parts of the world and there is no magic we can still do it. We've got to learn that from the Chinese. The Chinese have also taught us that we can lift a critical mass of our people from the loose ground of poverty into the hard ground of prosperity. We have something to learn from China. We can learn from China that you, when you want things to happen, you can relate with people on your terms. These are the things that we must learn from China. Sometimes I think that the second half of the 21st century is the African century. And you can begin to see the signs. You can begin to see the signs that Africans are beginning to ask fundamental questions. That Africans are beginning to organize themselves across the world. There is now no shortage of Pan-African initiatives across the world. In the tens, in the twenties, in the hundreds, the only thing that we must do is that we must know what it is that we are doing. Each one of us must play our part, as Julius Kambarake Nyerere of Tanzania said, and we must coordinate our efforts. So in conclusion, I am choosing to remind ourselves that yes, we were enslaved, but we were never eliminated. We were colonized, but we were never, never subjugated. The neo-colonial project was planned against us, but we were never intimidated. We have been subjected to many things which were designed to suppress us and to deny us the ability to express ourselves, but we have remained resilient. 
to use the words of Alex Haley, we were beaten into saying with our mouth that we were Tobies, but we never forgot that we were Kunta Kintes. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Muba. Thank you. So at this moment, I would like to invite my colleague, um, Dr. Clark, mm. to lead us in a short um, Q&A session. I know that uh, we ran over time, and we wouldn't want to keep it going for too long. So bear with us as we take a few questions, and then we can proceed from there. Uh, my question has to do with uh, an operational strategy, a strategy of unity. Now, one of the problems, I'm an African American, my people came in the belly of the slave ships. Others came here by airplane. That's a diabolical difference in perspective. But some will look at me and say, you know, you can't lead an African focus group because you wasn't born in Africa. Is it important that you be born in Africa or more important that Africans born in Africa? That's right. That's right. In your call for the African diaspora to come back, I wonder if you could tell us where we would go. Um, there is no right of citizenship that I, I can find um, in Africa for um, people of the diaspora to go to. Ghana, I know, has the right to a vote, but we want more than just a place to live. Um, we were promised at one time when Bill Clinton was president that there would be a right to us, a dual citizenship, maybe in Ghana, and that never happened because we were told that the people in Ghana they want us interfering in the politics. We don't care about the politics right now. We want a place to call home. We talk about Israel. Where do we go if we want to come back? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in September, uh, you were denied entry into Zambia. So I want to know, are you a tourist? Or, uh, <laughs> Tell us more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me take those and then I <laughs> let, let me respond to the last question first. <laughs> I've been invited to Zambia to preside over a graduation at a university called Eden University. And on the day of my arrival, I was scheduled to pay a courtesy call on President Kenneth Kaunda. And after paying a courtesy call on President Kenneth Kaunda, I was supposed to lay a wreath at the uh, grave of the president. <laughs> so in, and later in the evening, I was to talk about the place of China <laughs> in Africa. As I arrived, and we were with my wife here. She was ahead. As I arrived, I saw six individuals. And I said, this is the reception part. <laughs> A little did I know, as I approached them, they simply told me we have received instruction from the highest authority that you are not welcome to Zambia. Oh. Wow. And I asked, why am I not welcome to Zambia? I've been here before. And they told me, you, uh, there's a, it's a security issue. And I asked, is it my security that is under threat or the security of Zambia? I know subsequently the Zambian vice president was asked and did give a statement in parliament. And she said that it was on security grounds pressed further. She said uh, that uh, they have no obligation to diverge. But I, 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 in fact, I find it laughable and amusing that I can be a threat to security. But I can only speculate is that the subject of the presence of China in Africa is becoming a hot potato. And perhaps I have spoken one time too many about how to relate to China. And, and I keep on reminding my audience that I never blame the Chinese because the Chinese to their credit, their leadership have defined what they want for their people, and they are going about it. It is our duty to define what we want for our people. And why do I think that this is something that ought to uh, come to our attention? Many East African countries have been importing fish from China, and I'm happy that the Kenyan head of state only two days ago banned the, info the importation of fish from China. If we continue to import fish, we continue to import textile material, 
we continue to export raw goods, the net effect is that our countries will die economically. And there ought to be voices that are speaking about this often. Recently, you know that the Chinese told Africa, and this is part of the problem that we have. When we are dealing with Africa, China is dealing with Africa, it says, we have given Africa 60 billion. But Africa is 55 independent states. When you give them 60 billion, it's just about the GDP of Kenya. What can it do in real terms? And when they give 60 billion, what are we going to do with it? And I can therefore in response say that I think uh, the Zambians must now recognize that they created a mountain out of a mole and that it wasn't necessary. In fact, I've seen quite a number of uh, documentaries now beginning to document other people who had been denied entry into Zambia. And Zambia is a beautiful country, it was the cradle of the struggle for independence in Southern Africa during Kenneth Kaunda. It is sad that we are talking about African unity and we are denying Africans entry for no good reason. If I belong to one of these groups, I would myself say, yes, there is a good reason. But I belong to no such group. But in order to give you uh, some of the more practical nuances of this, one of the richest men in Africa is Nigeria's Aliko Dangote. And Aliko Dangote is on record as saying that even such a one as him, who is employing Africans in the thousands, has to grapple with 38 visa applications. 38 visa applications. In fact, Addis Ababa, the, the, the Ethiopians now have, in my view, a prime minister who is begin, beginning to see things in the right direction. And I hope he continues on that trajectory. It is only Kenya and Djibouti that does not need visa into Addis Ababa, which is the headquarters of the African Union. I believe that every country should have free visa entry into Ethiopia. Because as long as we continue to grapple with these visas, it, it can tell, these are the tariff and non-tariff barriers that stand in the way of Africa's realization of her potential. Which brings me to the question that you asked, where do we go back? I am of the considered view that Africans in the diaspora are now sufficiently organized to petition the African Union to have observer status at the African Union. If you then gain observer status, these are some of the things that you should use to confront the, the ambassador of the African Union here. I remember several years ago, an African-American lived in Nairobi and I acted for him as a lawyer. He called himself Shaka Zulu Asegai. <laughs> a very good name, Shaka Zulu Asegai. And he asked for two things. We went to court and applied for two things. At that time, the Kenyan constitution allowed that if an African man was married to an, any woman, then she could acquire status. We went to court and said that that was discriminatory and that Shaka Zulu Asegai, being married to a Kenyan woman, should also be a type. We cited all manner of international instruments on discrimination. And we also applied that Shaka Zulu Asegai should then be given 40 acres of land gratis. Of course, we failed on both accounts. But the beauty of it is that he, and he knew, I told him that we are going nowhere with this application. But sometimes you go to court not to get a judgment in your favor, but you do that in order to give visibility to an issue. Perhaps today, that is now becoming an issue that we ought to wrap our minds about. And it's not an idle question. It is very easy to come and say, Africans in their diaspora come, but where do you come? Do you start with Ghana? Do you start with Rwanda? But under the reforms that are now being undertaken, President Paul Kagame of Rwanda is leading a reform movement of the African Union. These are the issues that ought to be on the table. But you must be organized. Organized, and I believe the organization should be on an economic business front. Why do I think that that is more important? Today, in many African countries, the largest contributor to the GDP is remittance of income. Zimbabwe, for example, has nearly anything between four and five million Zimbabweans living outside of Zimbabwe. And those are some of their best men and women in terms of qualification. So that if they make demands, Kenya 
Nigeria, Ghana, all these countries. My own view, therefore, in a short trip answer to your question is, there is need for organization and collaboration so that we are able to approach the African Union. But this does not take away bilateral petitions and having Africans engage in fora such as this so that we are able to carry this agenda forward is not going to be easy. Because why do I say it is not going to be easy? In the last one week, I have seen Angola expel 180,000 Congolese. People have lived in the Congo for over 30 years, and they are being expelled and taken and driven into nothingness in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So there are these contradictions, but yet there are others who are welcoming. Rwanda has been very good in that regard. Rwanda allows people, East Africa, within the East African region, to get into Rwanda without war permit. It is also going to be useful to approach Africa through her regional blocks, the SADC block. If you go through the SADC block, then you are accessing quite a number of countries down there. If you go through the East African block, then you are accessing that particular uh, part of Africa. You go through the ECOWAS block and you go through the Central African block. And I now know that there are people from, Af from Africa, uh, from, from the United States of America, who are entering into commercial arrangements. I believe when that happens, then in the fullness of time, there will be a place to go to. And that place to go to will then make sense. But there is a caveat. In countries such as Liberia, where you have had this dichotomy, and you are aware of it, when the Liberian nation was established, there is still this tension between the so-called American Liberians and the indigents. Those are issues that I believe we can, uh, we, we can midwife something around them if there is clarity that there is this, this politics that makes people compete in a negative way. And the reason why there is negative competition in Africa about politics is that politics gives individuals who are not interested in the welfare of their country the opportunity to exploit their countries. The day we make sure that politics is an arena of service and does not give one undue advantage, then you will discover that you only want your best men and women to be in the political arena. And that will happen and must happen. I'm not naive to believe that it's going to happen without difficulties. I'm acutely aware that there will always be fifth columnists whose agenda is to destroy that which is good and right. The second thing is about historical black schools. One of the areas in which I think we have been very weak as African institutions, particularly in the education arena, and those of you will follow Africa, in the early 1980s, even I was a, when I was a student, there were universities that were famous for many things. Fura Bay in Sierra Leone was famous for engineering. Oh, the University of Ibadan in Nigeria was famous for engineering and other social activities. Makerere in Uganda was famous for engineering and, and, and medicine. What we have done in the recent past is to allow the proliferation of institutions that we refer to as universities but I essentially glorified high schools. <laughs> and the net effect is that there is no meaningful research that is taking place in those areas. And I'm answering this question to link it with what my good friend talked about in agriculture. The reason why I think we remain to punch below our weight is because we can't feed ourselves. Why do I say we can't feed ourselves in many areas? You go to many African countries, we are importing chicken from Brazil. We are importing to tomato paste from the United States of America. Hens is to be found on every table in every restaurant in, across Africa. We are importing milk from Nestle. We are importing water, we, we say we don't say we import it, but it's made water, drinking water, that's signed from Coca-Cola. Look at how we export our coffee. Somebody was giving me an analysis which I'd never thought about in the depth that he, uh, he had done. He told me, you can't roast your coffee. You have your farmer grow this coffee, it is brought to the United States of America, it is roasted in the United States of America, 
then look at the chain of employment that Starbucks creates so that you roast, you sell your coffee, say, for a dollar, but the Starbucks is going to sell a little cup of coffee, say, for five dollars. Just a notion, deal that way. Look at the chain. What you then produce because of, a, uh, because of Starbucks? Pepper, napkins, and all these. But the African farmer is stuck with coffee in its raw form. Look at tea. Kenyan coffee is some of the best in the world, but we use it, we export it for perhaps some planet. And you can go on and on in this area. What I am saying and what I've been saying is that we must do something about our education system. We must undertake research. And if you are not in agribusiness, then you are not in any place. And that is why the Ethiopians are making me happy in the sense that they are now saying, from the farm to the cup, from the farm to the mark, we are going to deal with it to ensure that we derive benefit. The other thing you talked about, agribusiness, look at the entire textile industry. The East African countries about two years ago agreed that they are going to ban the importation of second-hand clothing from the United States of America. Which was a beautiful thing. Kenya and Uganda did not follow through, but Rwanda did. And the dividends of that particular policy decision and implementation is in the next 10 years you are going to have the entire cotton industry in Rwanda revived. If you go to Nigeria, Nigeria has some of the best dressed men and women in the world. <laughs> in the world, without, without doubt. But most of their textile industries in the north are closed. So that what we call the beautiful Nigerian press is actually from the Netherlands, mm -hmm. is from Belgium. Suppose we, Nigeria, want to make a decision that we are going to revive our textile industry. And these things can be done. If little Rwanda can do it, you can imagine one in every five Africans is a Nigerian. Mm. They are some of the best educated men and women in the world, in any field. If the Nigerians were to make a decision that we can no longer just rely on oil, we are going to revamp our agriculture. We are going to produce oil. We are going to produce in many areas. I can't agree more, but it must happen at universities. The universities must be the locus. It must be the locus of research. And easier said than done, but once again, there is a sense in which the academic, the, the academic must now have a linkage with industry. And I say this because the, the Nigerian Aliko Dangote, I do not know how many of you have heard or know about Aliko Dangote. Aliko Dangote is an amazing individual, whether you like him or not. What he has succeeded in doing is to control the cement industry, and he is now competing with Lafarge and other companies in the world. I think in West Africa, Aliko Dangote is to be found in every other field. And there are many other African business people. And the politicians are beginning to listen to them. And the, once the politicians begin to listen to the business people, then they can begin to endow chairs at university so that Howard can have a linkage which is going to be a very practical nature, of a, of a practical nature. And my view is there will be initial baby steps. And we who are the pioneers will not even see the dividends of what is going to happen. But the fact that we have initiated them is, in my view, uh, a very useful thing. The final question in this uh, segment was, this old argument, where are you from? There is a sense in which Africa still continues to labor under very primordial instincts, particularly the African politician. He is always under threat. In 1960, and you'll remember this, there was a major debate in Africa about who is an African. And the key debaters at that time were Kwame Nukuruma. It led to get back to what was called the Nukuruma School as to who is an African. The other big debater was Chekante Diop of Senegal. And the other more prominent de debater was Leopold Sedar Senghor of Senegal. And you remember it gave back to the entire Negritude movement. And uh, 
the, the, the famous statement by Nigerian Zuwele Soinka that a tiger does not shout about his tigeritude. You follow the path of a tiger and you see the skeleton of an antelope and you know that some tigeritude has emanated from there. Those were debates. And at that time, they even argued that this idea that in order to be an African, you must be dark-skinned is without basis. And he argued that he knows very many dark-skinned individuals who are not Africans. <laughs> because in all their ways, they are Anglophile or Francophile. I want to thank you in particular. I follow all your, pretty much your public education work. I have one question, actually three. <laughs> Six, don't worry. Uh, one is, uh, I, can, I can see the zeal you have for Africa, which I appreciate uh, as a professor, because when we are, we are starting to work, we are like, how do we get academicians? Because the problem has been academicians. We say Africa is poor led, but we have doctors who are, can go and do a lot of work on that continent. The, problem, the reason why poor, uh, Africa is always poorly managed it's managed by people sometimes who don't have the capacity. I thank you for having taken the, the, the lead on that. And I thank you for also involving students. I saw you in Dar es Salaam, I saw you in uh, yeah, West Africa, South Africa, even Rwanda. And uh, on Rwanda, I'll come back to that. I come from there. But uh, believing in democracy, I believe you are entitled to your opinion, and I'm entitled to my opinion in the case of Rwanda. So my question is, you gave us your experience in Zambia. When you are into this kind of crusade of public education, a better world, it's not going to be easy. Do you, is there any, any precaution of those kind of resistance that you may get, especially in the good work you are doing? That's number one. Number two, that goes to the next question for the Africans in the diaspora. We all want to support you. We all want to work with the, the work you are doing. But sometimes you realize that when we become a voice here, we become like uh, put in the black books, like exactly what happened to you in, the, in, the, in the Zambia. Yet you are doing incredible work that is needed for the continent. Uh, how are we going to work with you? Uh, and especially uh, being a uh, Rwandese, uh, and I know Kenya, you are doing fantastic when it comes to democracy because you had you were in 2017 you had as a judge who rendered elections null and void which is an excellent uh, indication of at least in judicial independence we have civil society coming up last uh, i'm almost sort of winding up sudanese so oh, you had demonstrations on behalf of sudanese which is a fantastic move how are you going to really increase that that's my question thank you so much thank you very much Please, wait, quickly answer your questions. Hello, thank you. My name is Kumba Ture. Um, I am here from, actually fresh from Dakar, where I'm based, um, coordinator of Africans Rising for Peace, Justice and Dignity. And with several people here this morning, we've gone through um, the history of connection between the diaspora and Africa, and how people have been inspired back and forth. Uh, different people have taken inspiration from here or there to fight for, for their own liberation. Mm -hmm. And today, um, I hear from you, and we, we, we are all, I think, with you, uh, in what you say that we need to be organized, we need to be united, we need to be together. Mm -hmm. The question is, how? And the question is, um, what will be the structures? Um, how do we do this and behind what? Because uh, Africans Rising, we are building a movement. We are, we are calling people. And we know that it was easier to call a movement to fight apartheid, for example, because we knew what we can people to, to go against. Today we are decentralized movement because we know it's dangerous to be centralized. But we also pose a problem of how do we bring people together to work and behind one. Thank you. All right, thank you for speaking with us, uh, Professor Lumunda. I had uh, two questions, so I'll try to make them really quick. 
Uh, I wanted to ask about how you think that the perspective of uh, China might differ amongst the diaspora. And I say that because I think that we hear a lot about China here in the States, but I think that the U.S.'s incentives for disliking China may be different than the African incentive. You know, we, the U.S. is very anti-communist. Um, the U.S. has a long history of Orientalism. So I want to know your thoughts on that. And then also asking as well about China, um, I wanted to ask what you think it means for a self-proclaimed socialist country to be considered neocolonialist, um, if that has any significance, or if you view China as socialism or something. Thank you. I am. Letting go of the questions that I had. <laughs> because um, in your answers of the previous questions, you're so thorough and so round and so full that you answered several questions that I had. But I will put on the table for the future um, ideas around how to design our own program on how we deal with China. Because um, it wasn't just taking loans that helped lift China up, they did other things like close the doors for four years. Yes. Um, and the other is regarding education and revamping our educational systems here and globally and on the continent especially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Kofi Ejapon. I'm from the French Asante, West Africa, Ghana. I, um, I came here in 1962. I was 22. I am now 79. Wow. I went to Temple University. I'll preface this my caution on this thing. I went to Temple University and I graduated in, in, in accounting business. My advice, of course, Snyder, I went to tell him I was the CPA. He said, no, don't go to the CPA. Figures. You're smart. Go to law school. Take LSAT. So I took it. And uh, I got all the universities uh, that are there. I want to show you. He said, Look, all this will make you a you are, you are man white like me. Go to Howard University. So I came here. I went to law school in 1968. And I, <clears throat> in my readings, I discovered, Wow, we are lost. The man is right. <laughs> They are lost to the Arabs and the Europeans. So what do we do? Mm -hmm. A lot of great men have passed through this land. Great, great, great men, more than I can even imagine. Mm -hmm. And their minds have been uh, embedded in books. You must read together. Mm -hmm. So in my readings, I discovered that we need to, as a lawyer, form an organization. So in 1970, a year before I finished, we formed Sons of Doros of Africa. The continental Africans, those born in Africa, they over here, have no knowledge of these uh, people here. Mm -hmm. And the people here have no knowledge of the people there. People here, we call them diaspora Africa. The question to you is, as of now, we have chapters in Rwanda, Burundi, Ghana, Sierra Leone, of Sons of Doros of Africa who go to brothers and sisters who come there. Now here we don't have but the chapter in, in, uh, in DC here. So question, what do we do to get our people more awakened as sons and daughters of Africa? Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, in, in the last three years, I uh, found myself, uh, myself in about 20 WhatsApp groups <laughs> about Africa, 20 of them. In fact, as we were driving here, I received an invitation from one of them to attend a meeting on the 26th day of October in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, called Africa Watch. I belong to another one called State 55 which proceeds from the premise that all the 55 states should create a virtual African state. And what I suggested, I've suggested in all these groups, that perhaps there is wisdom in those of us who have multiple membership in these groups to consider a meeting of at least some of the initial leaders of these initiatives, so that even if you don't disband your initiative, you know what the other is doing. Because all these initiatives are created on the assumption that you are the only one who is doing something. Then as you begin to do things, 
you discover that the thing you think is new, others have been working at it for the last 10 years. And that there is nothing new that you are putting on the table, but you could have a different view to it. I think that there is beauty in the social media that can be used now to good effect. And I am satisfied, I run a foundation now, and I have uh, mentorship programs that are, is active in 25 African countries. And I'm convinced, because this we have done only in the last one year, I'm convinced that, and I don't have a concrete answer, that one of the things that we must now do, I did not know about the sons and daughters of Africa, how I wish I did, that we must have a method as to how that method should be dealt with. It is the duty of, and institutions are good. That's what I wanted to say. Howard University, which has a history, it is easy to create a program within an institution and to work with some of us who are already on the ground to begin to have these initiatives begin to read from the same page. And once again, I repeat that I'm not one who say that you bring them and dissolve them. There is always the difficulty. Yeah. You can always have, everybody wants to have these groups. The only idea is that you know that you are reading from the same script and where one is weak, one can be strong. No easy answers, but what we are beginning to do with an initiative which will have a meeting in Nairobi in the month of March next year is to invite all the organizations that we know about. We may not even know about all of them. But we are already inviting them to Nairobi in the month of March next year to, with a single agenda item. How do we coordinate our activities? No, nothing else. How do we coordinate our activities? And it is important not to ignore existing institutions. That is one of the things that sometimes we do. That we come into this agenda assuming that we have monopoly of knowledge and wisdom, which we don't have. And that therefore we speak with the arrogance that only inflame the anger of those in political office. My own view is, if you engage in a creative manner, then you open people's eyes. And that is why I think that ultimately these initiatives must have observer status. For those which are active in, in, in SADAC, I'm telling them, ensure you have observer status in SADAC. Ensure you have observer status in East African community. Ensure you have observer status in ECOWAS. Ensure you have observer status in all these. Then you can have observer status in the AU. Once you are inside, some of these issues can then be seen in the context of the long-term agenda for Africa. And this is part of the exercise in which I am engaged almost, I think in the last one year, I've aside from politicians, I've traveled across Africa more than most in terms of articulating this agenda. Which brings me to the question about, uh, uh, it is risky, that is true. In fact, yesterday somebody asked me a question, and I'm answering, answering this question, tying it up with the neo-colonial thing. This thing called democracy, what is it? What is democracy? Is democracy equals to multi-party politics? Is democracy equals to elections held periodically? There is a Ghanaian who has written about this, it's called The Place of African Culture, in governance, Nana Kobinan Kessier V, who himself was a political science professor at the University of Cape Coast. And he is saying that Africans must now begin to re-examine their systems of governance. And he argues that there is perhaps not a one-size-fits-all democracy. And that if we agree that that is the truth, then we could discover that governance structures need not be uniform the only thing that we must ensure happens is people's participation in the process of governance. And I think that that is a debate that we ought to articulate a lot more frequently because we have been deluded and been indoctrinated to believe that the, post, the, the developmental state must have structures that are Eurocentric. Therefore, your elections must be observed by the INDI your election must be observed by the European Union. And then if they don't give a, a, a sign, an imprimatur of legitimacy, then those are illegitimate elections. Is that the truth? Is it not a case now that we should ask ourselves whether they are governance systems? And the thing is people participation. 
the people must be allowed to participate in governance process. And even individuals who thought that command and control structures of leadership are beginning to recognize that. They will not do it immediately and suddenly and dramatically, but you begin to see signs that they are engaged in, even in the place that you talked about. You begin to see people being released, the people being allowed to do certain things. It is the beginning of acknowledgement that indeed you've got to allow ideas, because democracy, however defined, is a competition of ideas. You bring the ideas in the marketplace and you articulate them, the more deliverable they are, the more attractive they are to the electorate and the electorate buy them for a defined period. If they don't achieve, then they are second guessed and they are dealt with differently. Once again, I think that Africa has an opportunity to look at this thing. Sometimes people think, but will it help? Look at China which somebody, and I'm answering the question about China being a socialist country in the neo-colonial setting. And once again, I hold the view. I don't blame the Chinese. It is the duty of every civilization and every country to define what they want. The question is, in our totality as African countries, have we defined what we want? In my view, there is no evidence to suggest that we have. And why do I say so? If we are talking about African unity and the Angolan government is telling 180,000 Congolese to leave Angola without notice, could there have been a bilateral uh, engagement with the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo? Could there have been a better method of doing it? If the Ghanaian government is closing 40, uh, 400 Nigerian businesses on the ground that they are not capitalized at the level of one, one, billion, uh, one million dollars, is it fair? Can we then meet and eyeball each other as political leaders in Addis Ababa when we are disrupting countries in that way? In my view, we must define what we want. And I think history has demonstrated that whenever a civilization has defined what they want, and you said it when you are making, responding to my, uh, one of my answers, that part of the thing, I, I don't know whether it's you, but one of you said part of the reason why China became what it is, they closed their country. They simply said there are certain things that are not going to come in here. Then when they had come of age, they are now beginning to open. They are now beginning to say, even our yuan is available to compete alongside the dollar, alongside the euro. They, in other words, it must, but Africa is open for everything. Today, you go into many countries, and I have seen in many countries, part of the resentment in many African countries, is that our governments have allowed people from other civilizations to enter into things that the people could do. Hawking, for example, selling eggs, for example, selling ice cream, for example. You want to allow people to come in, and I think that the Ethiopians now have a model which ought to be emulated. They are building some uh, apparel factories in Masarawa, I think, in Ethiopia. And what they are doing, they are saying the Chinese who are leading it will come here at managerial level. And they stay in for five years, and then they must transfer technology. The employees must be Ethiopian. And that is going to create 100,000 jobs. And in addition to that, is going to revive the cotton industry. They are doing that with their leather industry. You now go to Addis Ababa Border International Airport and you see leather shoes. So it is just not uh, hides and skins. It is hides, it is tanning, it is converting them into leather. And that it will then force Louis Vuitton to have factories in Ethiopia. We are going to, if you look at quite a number of these things that we use in colognes and, and, and perfumes, that is a multi-billion industry, but there is not a single African country that is in that perfumery sector. There, there are many things, and uh, I think it is you who was telling me, the Viola Green here was telling me about the 1.87 trillion dollars that the African Americans generate through purchases. 1.8 trillion, and that might also be conservative. You imagine that only half of that, because the African GDP last year combined, however you want to manipulate it, was not more than 2.5 trillion dollars. 
for a population of 1.345 billion, because Congo and Nigeria never count properly. <laughs> <laughs> they are better doing their census on that regard. So I'm saying that we could easily be 1.5 billion. And, and to me, when the old man talked about agriculture, that is going to be the game changer. That is going to be the game changer right now. And, and, and I'm possibly over answering the question. The bulk of the beef, and this is a paradox, that the beef that is produced in Botswana goes to the European market, but we are importing beef in many African countries from Argentina and Brazil. We are even the more recent history of countries such as South Korea. The academy is the incubator of ideas. And in many African institutions, at the very beginning I said that I remember in 1980s, not so long ago, Fura Bay. Those of you who are familiar with West Africa will know Fura Bay in Sierra Leone, in Freetown. Was one of the leading universities in Africa and the world. Today, Fura Bay has lost her luster because the politicians don't know that that's where you produce your engineers. The University of Ibadan. In Nigeria, the University of Nigeria at Nsuka, Makere University, the South Africa that if those of you who have visited South Africa will see that South Africa is very different from the rest of Africa in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the thing that they afford their people, because like it or not, the Africaners never thought they would leave South Africa. And they built that country to guarantee their comfort. You see the roads. They wanted to be comfortable. This is what Africans must do. We must do things to guarantee our comfort. Have good roads. Have good schools. Finance them. And the academics must be crusading academics. I remember as a very young man when uh, the first heart transplant was uh, Dr. Christian Bernard. Many of you will remember this. The first human heart transplant was by a South African uh, uh, Africana called Dr. Christian Bernard at the Kruskir Hostel. And it was all over the world. So in agriculture and in all these sectors, the ac academia must begin to play a critical role. And the reason why the academic is important is because many things are easier to do, not easy, but easier to do around institutions with reputation. If you do it as an individual, you'll be second guess, but who are you? Why do you want money? But if you do it under the aegis of an institution, then it is easier to deal with, and people have this sense of comfort in dealing with you because it is institution. I want to conclude my presentation by saying that I believe, and I believe very strongly, that on the basis of the evidence that I see in Africa, and on the basis of the rhetoric that I'm now beginning to see, there is one critical thing that is beginning to happen in Africa. The recognition, particularly by the younger Africans, that if they don't participate in processes, then true change will not come. The only thing that we need to do is to help these Africans in our own small way. If you can be a mentor even for five and a mentor for six, let us begin to energize the African base. And one of the things that I think is going to be a game changer for Africa is what some have said called the youth dividend. A young man in Zimbabwe, in asking me a question, told me, do you know that if Africa does not solve the problems of the youth, the youth will be the problem of Africa? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought that the question was deep and philosophical at once. And I, in my response, I said that the youth must not imagine that there are people out there who are going to solve their problems. It is incumbent upon the youth to participate in solving their own problems. Because this idea of thinking that the government will create jobs and you'll be employed is misguided. What the government ought to do is to create an environment where you can innovate and invent. And I gave the example of Uber. I said we now have somebody in the United States of America controlling how we take taxis in Bangui in Central African Republic. <laughs> Don't we have the ability? And they're using our own people. It is ideas the possibilities that have been brought into being through the fourth industrial revolution, through robotics and other things, is amazing. 
you can influence the world from Howard University and have a presence. We now have agriculture. I'm coming back to agriculture every so often. There are now uh, examples in Africa where people are beginning to look at agriculture, not in the traditional form. You are going into the arena of drip irrigation so that you don't depend on rain-fed agriculture. You are going into the arena of, uh, of using uh, uh, equipment which does not require labor. Uh, and therefore, we must begin to think ahead of the times. And if we think ahead of the times, I think that Africa is in a good place. And I can't overemphasize this. The recognition and realization that we of the African stock, if we don't have our hands on deck, and if we don't move in the right direction, we will not realize our potential. The opportunity, fortune favors the vigilant. I think that is the name of the game, and it has never changed. And luck is for those who have bought the lottery ticket. If you don't buy the lottery ticket, no matter how much you pray and fast, you will never win the jackpot. So I think let us buy the lottery ticket, and then we can pray and fast. God bless you. Uh, my name is Tania Hope Navas. I am the director of the Ralph Bunch International Affairs Center here at Howard University. And I know that we've been here for a wonderful presentation, and I know we could probably stay here for a lot longer and continue this conversation. I certainly would like to, but I know we all have places to go and things to do, but I did want to take a moment to um, thank uh, Dr. Lumumba for, for your presentation, your words. Uh, I'm over here as a daughter of Liberia myself. Um, very happy to have welcomed you here to Howard University. And thank you for inspiring us and encouraging our students to go to Africa, which is, we do study abroad in my center, and we are working diligently to make sure that Howard University students do get out of this country and find the diaspora wherever it is. Um, we have a little gift for you. You remember your visit to the Mecca? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we hope that you do come back again so we can continue this conversation. <laughs>